Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting to you from Tel Aviv. And I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today we will begin a series of four programs about the United Nations, on which I feel is one of the most important subjects I have written. On this program, we will talk about the UN structure and the fact that Israel, unlike any other nation, is being constantly isolated. And we will provide you with information on why and how it is happening. On the program today, the United Nations General Assembly and its makeup. Israel is treated unlike any other state. A spiritual explanation. Finally, our panel guests will share their Israeli perspectives concerning the activities of the UN. The United Nations began its life on October 24, 1945 made up of a group of mostly democratic nations, about 65%. The goal was to create a forum to discuss and solve conflicts between nations and bring help to peoples around the world in need. But today, the UN has turned into an automatic majority of dictatorial regimes under the leadership of Islamic states that are anti-democratic and most of all, anti-Israel. Think of it. Out of 193 members of the UN, there have been times when only three nations cast a vote in favor of Israel. The US, Israel, and the island of Micronesia. Today, the outcome of any UN General Assembly vote is virtually certain with a couple of wildly unusual exceptions, as when the UN voted to birth Israel in 1947, the UN General Assembly resolutions against Israel are always ratified by an overwhelming supermajority. It is enlightening and important for us as believers to understand how the United Nations mechanism works. It is difficult to find a brief but understandable explanation of this world body. But here's a quick summary. First of all, in the General Assembly, every nation is represented and every nation has one vote, whether China with 1.3 billion citizens or the island of Nauru, with 10,000 inhabitants. This structure was selected with the goal of giving equality to all the peoples of the world. So what exactly is it that makes the UN General Assembly automatically anti-Israel? First of all, there is a block of 21 homogeneous Arab Muslim nations with common ethnicity, religion, and culture. Though they often fight among themselves, they rarely have a problem uniting against Israel. They tightly coordinate their activities through their organization called the Arab League. Secondly, there is the OIS, Organization of Islamic States, which includes the Arab League members plus another 35 Islamic nations making a solid block of 56 Islamic countries. Next, there is a third block of 68 nations under the NAM label, N-A-M, Non-Aligned Movement, which together with the Islamic states that are also a part of NAM, creates a whopping 124 voting block. NAM is made up of mostly developing nations with just a few having some trappings of democracy. The 20 plus partially democratic countries in the NAM orbit 
are completely under Arab leadership. And the majority of NAM nations are run by brutal anti-American and anti-Israel dictators, such as Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Zimbabwe, and Saudi Arabia. Most General Assembly resolutions need only a simple majority of 97 votes to pass any resolution. Add in Russia and a couple of its satellites, and you have a supermajority of 129 votes without having to lobby a single Democratic member from Western-style democracies. It is true there are approximately 63 strong democracies, which include the European Union, America, Canada, Australia, some island nations, and a few other democratic friends. But by themselves, they can do virtually nothing in the General Assembly. In fact, nations in the European Union, cognizant of the critical importance of oil for their countries, often vote with the Arab core. So bottom line, the Arab bloc controls the UN. At times for very important resolutions, a supermajority is required, but only of those present. Members of the European Union love to abstain on votes concerning Israel. That way, they don't rub the Arab League in the wrong way. And by the time the abstentions are counted, the Muslim nations have nothing to worry about as they push through their anti-Israel agendas. And their number one agenda is to make Israel disappear. A 2005 report by the United States Institute of Peace on UN reform said that contrary to the UN Charter's principle of equality of rights for all nations, Israel is denied rights enjoyed by all other member states. They impose a level of systematic hostility against Israel, which is routinely expressed, organized, and funded within the United Nations system. Every year, the UN celebrates its annual International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. A few years ago, the event was attended by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan and other high-ranking diplomats. It was noticed that they were sitting next to a map printed by the Palestinian Liberation Organization. What was significant was that Israel had disappeared from the map. The then U.S. Ambassador John Bolton wrote to the U.N. Secretary General, of specific and most immediate concern is the signal potentially sent when three top UN officials, yourself and the President of the Security Council and the General Assembly participated in an event with a map of Palestine prominently displayed, which erases the state of Israel. It could be construed to suggest that the United Nations tacitly supports the abolition of the state of Israel. In fact, in the 1980s, the Arab states worked relentlessly to expel Israel from the UN altogether. Only a determined U.S. lobbying campaign prevented them from succeeding. Most Westerners consider the United Nations as a highly moral and respected institution, a worthy organization which examines and weighs the difficulties of the world and dispenses justice and rightness through its resolutions and works, attempting to make the world a better place. But the human race has fallen and all institutions degenerate when God's wisdom and order is replaced by man in center stage. The United Nations is a microcosm of the nations of the world. 
Indeed, it is the world. So what should we expect? Justice? Morality? Loving our brother as ourselves? Following biblical values? But to the point, why is the epicenter of the UN's rage and indignation focused on just one nation, Israel? The answer can only be explained in spiritual terms. The fact is that God, the God of Israel, foretold centuries ago of his special purpose for the people of Israel. Naturally, Satan, whom the Bible says is the God of this world, loathes the true God, loathes his plans and the object of his plans. To me, it is easy to believe that Satan's evil is ruling this world. Just look around and see the chaos enveloping our beautiful planet. Because of God's plan to send his Messiah back to earth to rule from Jerusalem, it follows that Satan despises Israel and, in fact, that hatred extends to any person or nation being used to bring life and goodness to the world. So back to the UN. Are you now aware that the UN's most aggressive agenda by far is the demonization of the Jewish state of Israel? Next week, we will give you known facts that will show you exactly what the UN is doing behind its closed doors. Please stay with us as we turn to our panel of guests. Maos Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand with Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. We will now turn to our panel seeking their perspective on what is happening in the UN and how it relates to Israel. Today in the studio with us are the Director of Operations for TBN Israel, Mati Shoshani from Jerusalem, and Shadi Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem. And I can tell you that they were both born and raised in Israel. And Israel Pachter, his name is Israel. Israel Pachter was born in the former uh, Soviet Union. He is now the pastor of Beit Halel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod. Thank you for joining me. It's great being here. We got some interesting questions today. The Bible, for instance, records that the actual borders that God gave to Israel as an inheritance. One example is in Genesis 15, 18, which says, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, or his name at that time was Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Israel, I want to ask you, if these are the God-given borders that God has promised eternally to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then why doesn't Israel have all of these borders right now? It's a matter of time, I believe, because uh, every word of the Bible is truth. And uh, what we have in today in Israel, the number of prophecies that came to pass encourage us to believe that what God has started, he will continue 
and it will accomplish. So it's just a matter of time. We not always can understand or know all the details, how things will go, mm -hmm. but we have uh, very uh, strong prophecies that taking us, giving us all the details, and uh, we just believe it. How long do you think uh, it's going to be before Israel has all of her land? I have no answer for that, but we all pray. Five years, hoping. ten years, twenty years, thirty years. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe thirty, fifty. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we, we really know it will happen. It will right. Happen. How do you think that's going to happen? How is Israel, uh, who's barely holding on to the land we have today, um, how's it going to take back? all the land to the Euphrates River. I think scripturally, though, you also have, you know, when Joshua came into the land, they didn't, God didn't give them the entire land yet because they, they wouldn't have known what to do with it, you mm -hmm. know? They, they didn't have enough people. They hadn't, they, he, God said that if he would have given them all the land, it would be filled, if he'd taken all the other people out and yeah. just given it to Israel, it would be filled with jackals and all, you know, all sorts right. of wild animals because they wouldn't be able to fill it. But there's something more. The people of Israel who came into the land were commanded to take the entire land, did not take the entire land. And if you look historically, we've never had, you know, what's described in the Bible, we've never had those, those full borders. I mean, the largest the country of Israel was up till 48, was under, under King Solomon. That didn't include the entire borders mentioned in the Bible. Right. And today, we're closer to that. We were closer at certain points in the past when we had the Sinai Peninsula. But we're not there. And I think... Many people think they have like, you know, a full grasp of exactly yeah. what's going to happen in the mm -hmm. Bible. We've been surprised every time throughout history right. without any exceptions. That's one thing we know for sure. Well, I think that uh, a lot has to do with the number of the people of God in Israel that are truly, truly committed to the Lord because uh, the more believers there are in Israel, I believe, the larger the, the uh, borders will get. And so uh, I think that we're going to have all of Israel when the people of Israel are serving God and through the Messiah. Yeah. That's you know, Shira, my personal belief. You touched a great point because you see all the promises of God to us, they are uh, conditionally. I mean, of course, the yeah. biggest condition is grace of the Lord for sure. Right. But there, are, they, they, there is conditions. And we see how more we as Israelis will walk with Yeshua and will turn to the truth God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to the Bible, we will see changes in our region. It will change it all. So our walk with God uh, will make a difference. Right. I think there's, there's a, big, a big piece to this puzzle that we're overlooking, which is the fact that it's not just a promise for Israel. This God is not only interested in the people of Israel or today in the state of Israel. It's a promise of a full restoration of God's creation and promise yes. to mankind. Right. So when we say the restoration of the state of Israel, what we, people imagine is referring to the state of Israel today, God's talking about something much broader. It's a restoration of God's kingdom, which is godly values, godly and righteous uh, leadership, governance, and everything that goes along with that, and something that happens in the region. And one last thing is when we think about the complicated situation in this region, it's not talking just about the Jews. There were always pockets of non-Jews, of goyim, as they're called, of Gentiles, yes who lived among the Jews, even in the time when we had control, biblically speaking, there were Gentiles who followed yes. God in the same way. Yes. So something is going to happen in this region that is outside of just Israel taking military control or right. whatever, uh, Israel the state, not just the person. <laughs> right, right. Well, Israel has no lack of enemies. In fact, you know, you can almost count the friends on uh, your fingers, the U.S. Micronesia. Micronesia. <laughs> yes. Good allies. Um, the island of Nauru, um, a few other Marshall Islands, uh, Canada, Australia. Um, that's not many more than that. But our enemies, and let's talk about this because we have lots of enemies right around us. So how do we, as born-again believers, born-again Jewish believers, how do we deal with those who tell us they're, they're our enemies? You know, we're not saying you're my enemy. They're saying we are your enemies. How, how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, I think as a believer, of course, we love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. I think that worked really well with the Apostle Paul, who was an enemy of believers. I really believe that the body came together and prayed for him, and he had this amazing transformation. Um, 
Mm-hmm. I, and I think that on some level, as, as relatively godless as Israeli culture can be, there is something about the approach that Israelis have towards her enemies, which is it's almost like one in one hand they have a shotgun, in the other hand they have their hand out in aid. It's kind of like, okay, don't shoot me, I'm going to give you some, here you go, you know? So the approach is, is both cautionary and trying to um, engage right. the enemy and try to separate the aggressive enemy and the passive enemy. Okay, but Mati, what do you do with uh, Arab believers, Mm -hmm. okay, that have actually asked Yeshua, Jesus, into their hearts, but they believe that Israel is occupying land that belongs to the Palestinians and they want a Palestinian state. What do you do with those kind of Arab believers? You're asking a very tough question, and I'll try to make a fair, a fair answer. One, when you say Arab Christians, there are different kinds of Arab Christians. Yes. So if, if someone's watching this at home, you know, there, there isn't just one type of uh, Arab Christian. There's not just one type of Messianic Jew. Some of these Arab Christians come from Arab Christian denominations. Yeah. Their doctrine and their, their political opinions and everything that, that sort of follows that are dictated by a church. Replacement theology. Some, yeah, some of that comes with, it, with replacement theology. In other words, they haven't just sat down and thought about what they believe in. This yeah. is something that's been going on right. for centuries right. and relates and has been changed by circumstances in the area where, generally speaking, the denominations in the, in the land, especially the right. Eastern churches, the Orthodox churches, Okay, but let's talk about born-again evangelical Arab Christians. So here, okay. here's something really interesting and encouraging at the same time. Mm-hmm. But by what I've seen, most... Muslim background believers, as in people who came into not the religion of Christianity, but the faith in Jesus, Yeshua, yeah. most of them love Israel. That's right. And the reason is, right. is because they've, and this is my, of course, interpretation, yeah. they've abandoned their previous faith, which was Islam, right. or, or the, right. the Muslim lifestyle. Right. They open up their Bible, and what do they see? Yes. The land of Israel, the people of Israel, they say, see it. okay, see so it. if this is what God says, right. then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to love the people of okay. Israel. Okay, Shani, you, uh, your kiddos go to a, a Jewish Arab school where they're learning both uh, Hebrew and Arabic. Now, you have teachers and mothers of other children that you're meeting. How, do you, how is the typical Israeli Arab non-believer, how do, they, how do you interact with them? I mean, first of all, on some level, when I walk into the school, Sometimes I can't tell who's Jew and who's Arab. I have to wait till they start talking in whatever language and be like, okay, you're Jewish, you're Arab. Because they just were so close, you know. Um, But also I think that it's notable that the Arabs in the school call themselves Arabs. And the Palestinians that do all this hoopla, I know this is a blanket statement, but Uh the very fact that they're identifying themselves as Arab is honest. We're Arabs. We're Israeli Arabs, and um, they are the type of Arabs that you want to have as friends. They're right. educated. They want their kids to get along with Jews. We want yeah. our kids to get along with them, and it's, it's this beautiful right. harmony, even though it's not like we all agree, but we all learn right. to live together in right. whatever disagreement right. we have. Where on the other hand is you have these people that are identifying themselves as something that is, is specifically you know, uh, campaigning for right. the removal of Jews. Yeah. You know, I think it's okay, just Israel. Spirit. I want to give you the last word. Do you minister with uh, Arabs, uh, brothers and sisters? And if so, what is your relationship? How, how do you talk about the uh, situation that's going on all the time? Uh, difficulties between Arabs and Jews? Yeah. Yes. In my city, we have no Arabs. You know, in Israel, we yeah. have mixed cities when right. we study together, like Shani said. Uh, but also, we have city that only Arabs or only Jewish. In my city, it's only. Uh, Jewish. But uh, we have neighbor cities and we have uh, common projects with uh, wonderful brothers who love the Lord, but also they have biblical perspective on Israel. They're not fanatics and, you know, I'm not going to eat, but, but they really love Israel and I understand for them it's better to be in Israel. Why? Because one of friends, he said he used to live under Islamic rule, his family, for 800 years. And they know what it's like. So he really appreciates to be part of Israel. And of course, as, as bin Arab, he has his uh, you know, plus and minuses, or he yeah. thinks of, right. I agree with that and not right. agree with that. But we all agree with yeah. some things in Israel, and we don't agree with you some. You know, I find working with uh, other Arab believers, 
Um, I don't ask them, do you love Israel? If that love is there, I can work with them. Uh, if somebody comes along and just hates Israel, I don't care if they say they believe in Yeshua, then I would have a really difficult time um, uh, working with that, with that person. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for watching, and we do hope we were able to give you insight into the UN, which will help you pray in a more focused way for our nation and also for your nations. For more articles about Israel, sign up to the free Moe's Israel Report at maosisraelorg slash sign up. Please make sure to tune in next week for the episode of Israel Frontline, where we will examine the more powerful arm of the UN, the Security Council, whose resolutions are considered international law. On behalf of our team and myself, Shalom from Tel Aviv. I Stand with Israel is a benevolence outreach of Maoz Israel Ministries. Since its establishment in 2002, we have distributed over $4 million to meet the practical needs of Israelis, believers and non-believers. We support Arab believers and Ethiopian congregations. We provide financial aid and medical assistance. We grant education scholarships to students and children who study music. We partner with other ministries and sponsor conferences. We help individuals and businesses persecuted for their faith in Yeshua. Because of the generosity of our partners around the world, we have a privilege to help people in need, reaching out to them with the love of God in a practical way. We invite you to, to stand with Israel. A good book can make a real difference in a believer's life. The goal of Maoz Hebrew Books Division is to bring great faith books to Israeli readers in their language. We translate, edit, typeset and print these books in Hebrew and then make them available in congregations across Israel.